Thank you, Tasha. Let us pray. Loving Father, through your spirit, you inspired Luke to record this incident for us. Through your spirit, you have kept this gospel intact down these 20 centuries. Through your spirit, you have brought it now before us. And we ask you, through that same spirit, to guide us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus has contributed to the richness of many languages, English included. Some of his sayings are so powerful and insightful that people down the centuries have used them because they have recognized the unequaled wisdom in them. You could think of the phrases, love your enemies, or turn the other cheek, or walk the extra mile. All of these phrases borrowed directly from Jesus' teachings. Our passage for today also has one. Now, put new wine in old wineskins may not be very commonly used, but it also comes to us from Jesus. Unfortunately, as is the case with most of Jesus' most profound statements, like the ones I just mentioned, this one also has become obscured with sentimentality and who knows what else. Actually, in, the case, uh, in this case, we will see uh, that the confusion actually is because we are trapped, we are trapped in our sequentiality, in our, in our time in the fact that we think what we have might be better than what others have had. Anyway, let us see first what is the common way of looking at this passage. Luke tells us that Jesus was approached by some Pharisees and teachers of the law about the failure of his disciples to fast. Now fasting was one of the pillars of the Jewish religion and uh, we see Jesus actually addressing this practice in the Sermon on the Mount where he actually advocates fasting as a celebration rather than as a demonstration of one's piety and austerity. This was contrary to the practice, the common practice in which people would try to show their spiritual superiority by fasting more often, more rigorously, and of course by advertising it. From the question posed to Jesus, it seemed that Jesus did not encourage his disciples to fast, at least not publicly. To the question of why his disciples do not fast, Jesus asks if anyone fasts while there is a wedding celebration. The joy of a wedding supersedes the practice of, of fasting because, simple, I mean, a wedding is a once in a lifetime event. You can fast the next day also. So uh, just a simple issue of which is more rare makes one more superior. So he asks, can you make the bridegroom's friends fast. In other words, even expecting them to fast while the bridegroom is around is an impossibility. But he tells them there will be a time of sorrow and at that time his disciples will fast. But then he proceeds to tell them two short parables. Who would mend an old shirt with a patch of cloth from a new one? The colors would not match because the old shirt would have faded and the new shirt would be damaged in the process. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. The new wine is newly fermented and very potent, therefore. All the chemical reactions are not finished. The old wineskins are, however, worn with use. They cannot handle the potency of this newly fermented wine. And so Jesus says the new wine should be put into new wineskins. Now the common understanding is that Jesus is saying that the old wineskin of Jewish religion cannot handle the potency of the gospel and that if we were going to try to mend Jewish religion with a, you know, a part of the gospel, both would be destroyed. That's the common understanding. All, and all of this seems well, but, yes, there is a but. And it's this but that I struggled with the entire time I was preparing and even today, I was not able to participate in, in, in the, the singing too much. 
but uh, I think it's all okay. I don't know who chose the song, Suvi. Was it Nikki? I don't know Nikki. But something has happened. She managed to choose songs that seem to be right with what I thought God was leading me to say. So, all's well. There is a but. The approach seems okay. But it cannot take into account the sentence with which Jesus concludes his parables. And if you know how parables work, it is the last sentence that holds the key. It is the final statement that tells you what, how you should have been understanding the parable. The ending provides this twist in the tale and forces us to reevaluate how we understood the parable. Unfortunately, in this case, we simply overlook this concluding statement and as a result, we misunderstand what Jesus is saying. So, what is this concluding sentence? Jesus ends this part by saying, No one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Now, wineries and breweries go through a lot of effort to age their products carefully. A good wine that has been aged, let's say, two years instead of one, will cost much more than double the newer wine, simply because Wine mellows with age, it assimilates the flavors of the barrel, the chemical reactions get completed, and so it's not as acidic and acerbic in your mouth. It develops a more smooth taste, more pleasing taste. And so older wine is better. So Jesus observes that, the old is better. And this is true of our clothes too. I'm wearing a new shirt today, yeah? Yeah. Just for today. No, I'm just kidding. It just so happened. How many of us hang on to an old shirt or old top? It may be too worn out to be worn out. Yeah? But but we decide that since it means worn in, we'll wear it in. Right? That's what it is. Because because we don't discard it. We we, we don't... Why don't we just throw it away, treat it like a rag, wear something else? simply because through its continued use it has begun to fall over our shoulders just the way we like it. It fits in the armpits just the way we like it. It has become ours. The new one is not yet ours. The old one is ours. We feel free in it. We are clothed but not constrained. Unlike with a new shirt that is still a little too stiff. Yes, as Jesus observes, the old is better. This is how he ends the two parables. In the case of the shirt, he seems overly concerned with the fact that the patch from the new shirt will not match the old. Do you notice that? He's concerned about that. He's not saying, don't bother with mending the old. He's saying you don't use a new one to mend the old. He's concerned with the old. Why? It's already tattered. Who cares if it matches also? But he seems to be concerned that it wouldn't match the old. And in the case of the wine, he's he's quite saddened not just that the new wine is wasted, the new wine will flow out, yes, but that the old wineskin is ruined. It's not just that it's it's burst, it's ruined. It's a very strong word that he used. Why is he concerned with these old things that have evidently been used too long? He says, no one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. The old is better. The old is better. But the common interpretation says that the gospel which is new is better than the old Jewish faith. Which is exactly the opposite of what Jesus is saying. He's saying the old is better. So what in the world is Jesus saying? Our mistake is that we think Jesus is juxtaposing the older Jewish faith with the newer Christian faith and we say things like the Jewish faith 
like the old wineskins, cannot accommodate the new Christian faith, which is like new wine. But Jesus says, the old is better, which should give us pause when we interpret it in this manner. But what if Jesus is not contrasting the Jewish faith and the Christian faith? After all, Jesus, whether we like it or not, was born a Jew. And whether we like it or not, he died as one too. And from his words in the Gospel of Matthew, it is clear that he saw his own work not as an annulment of the Jewish faith, but as a fulfillment or continuation of it. To, for him now to contrast what he is doing with what the Jewish faith is would be quite strange. It would not be the same Jesus. But we are comfortable with that. But what if he is contrasting two other things? Let us look at our text more closely, without the normal antagonism we have towards the Jewish faith, and look at it in its larger context rather than only this little passage. After Jesus calls Peter, James and John, we dealt with that passage last week, we read that he heals a man who had leprosy. He tells the restored man, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to a priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded you to offer as a cleansing, as a testimony to them. He is asking the man to be subject to the law given by Moses. Then we read that Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. At his words of forgiveness, the Pharisees and the leaders of the law, uh, the teachers of the law, accuse Jesus of blasphemy. They ask him, who can forgive sins but God alone? Then we read that Jesus had a meal at Levi's house. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law take offense because he is mingling with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus asks, it is, he says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So, once again, Jesus heals a man of leprosy, subjecting himself to Moses' law, and then faces two situations that are contradictory. On the one hand, he is told he should not announce forgiveness, because only God can do that. And on the other hand, he is told that those who need forgiveness should be shunned. <coughs> In other words, even God can't offer them forgiveness because they are to be shunned. Only God can offer forgiveness, but these are sinners and tax collectors and they should be shunned. So, even God is then now excluded from their presence because who else will go to them with God's forgiveness? And so Jesus comes to this conclusion that something is seriously wrong, not just with Jewish religion, but with all systems of religion. Religious systems mediate divine presence and divine blessings through four traps. Holy practices, holy times, holy places, and holy people. The Jews had these, the holy practices of prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. Their holy periods of the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles and other feasts and their holy places like the temple in Jerusalem and the synagogues and their holy people like the priests and Levites. And lest we point a finger at them, we also have our wonderful four. Holy practices, daily devotions and Bible studies, our holy periods of Sunday services and prayer meetings and healing services, our holy places like our churches and cathedrals and our holy people like our priests and pastors and bishops and like the Jews we point a finger at those who happen to go against the norms of these practices these holy practices holy periods holy places and holy people we beat ourselves and beat others over forgetting to read the Bible one day falling asleep before praying we accuse people who do not come to our all-night prayer marathons or our prayer services or whatever it is. We slight those who are not regular attenders at church and we think if there is a holy person around, he better pray before he leaves. 
he better announce a benediction. Where in all of this is the freedom that Jesus promises? By insisting that our life of faith is mediated through these holy practices and at holy periods, in holy places and by the holy people, we keep ourselves away from the immediacy of God in our lives. We keep ourselves from the spontaneity of a relationship with this God who wants to surprise us daily. And it was not so at the start. When God first created us, there was no mediation. Our relationship with him was immediate, that is, without a mediator. That is how it is supposed to be. When Jesus talks about the old, he is referring to this, our original state, in which we were able to approach God as a friend without the trappings of what is religious. And when he talks about what is new, he is referring to our current preference of having our relationship with God mediated by all that we consider holy practices, periods, places and people. Like new wine, unshrunk cloth, this new understanding of what is holy destroys and damages the old understanding. But it is the old understanding that is better. It is the immediate relationship with God which we are originally created for that is better than all the religious systems that we have now adopted. But the old way, the immediate way, fits us just right because that's what was made for us just like an old shirt that is ours. And it is smooth and flavorful just like well-aged wine. But the immediate relationship with God is uncomfortable. God cannot be fooled, even if we fool ourselves. Rather, He is the one that shines His light to dispel all the darkness in our lives. And like Adam and Eve, we can no longer bear the unnerving, immediate presence of the living God. And just like they did, so we also hide ourselves behind all our religiosity, the holy practices, the periods, the places and the people. All of this that allows us to think that we are having a genuine relationship with God when in fact we are hiding. So if we came today, because it was announced that worship would be mediated by Suvi who then dis decided to allow Nikki to do it or because the message would be mediated by Deepak we need to ask ourselves why why is it that certain conditions must be met before we encounter God all of these are temptations to lure us to embrace all the counterfeits we Christians are guilty of this as much as the Jews of Jesus day. We encourage the development of various personality cults and follow this preacher or that worship leader as though these people have some special powers of ushering in God's presence. We still call the land of Israel a holy land and try to make pilgrimages to it when the New Testament is quite clear that any place where two or three are met in Jesus' name is automatically holy. Attending church worship services has become a duty rather than a celebration. Oh, it's Sunday, we need to go to church. And we look at disapproval on those who are not as regular as we are or those who happen to arrive late without knowing what their circumstances are. The irony is that we engage in all of these practices and still convince ourselves of our true and deep spirituality when in fact we are only being as shallow as our practices allow us to be. For if I cannot encounter God through my normal activities on every day of the week, every hour of the day, at any place, at any time, with anyone around me, without the mediating presence of anyone else, wherever I am, whatever I am doing, 
Then I have forgotten what that old wine tastes like, and I have accepted the new. And I have forgotten the genuine article and have embraced some sort of counterfeit. In other words, if you are not able to meet him and encounter him during your week, it's not going to happen here either. Because as Jesus tells us, we can only recover the vitality of this authentic relationship with God if we recognize all these counterfeits, all these mediators, everything that comes as the newest thing that God is doing. The new way. The new movement of the Spirit. And we recognize first that the old is better.